Hey, ORAT family. On this video, Mr. Zuber spoke at the conference I just hosted, which was called Business Ownership Summit. And I asked Michael if he would do a presentation on the economy, and we tied it in with small business ownership. So stay tuned on this episode. You'll see the kickoff of the event and Zuber dropping some amazing bombs. So see you on the inside. As always, you can book a discovery call with me if you need financing, if you want some ideas on some businesses. You can go to onerentalmeeting.com and check out the video. Probably ready to kick off the event with the one and only Mr. Zuber. Michael Zuber, I met five years ago, I believe, six years ago. I actually met him in Virginia at a real estate event. And we happened to both at the time live in the Bay Area. <laughs> and um, he had just, I believe he had just written his book, One Rental at a Time. And then uh, after the Virginia, he, he, I used to run a meetup in Walnut Creek and he spoke there. And uh, ever since I've been watching his journey, uh, I participate on his channel now. He's got the, the One Rental at a Time YouTube show, mm -hmm. and he puts out a ton of content. He's known as the hammer for a reason, and uh, he does the work. And I can, I can tell you something like, I am so impressed with you because you do what you say and you just go and no, like, when you wanted to start your YouTube channel, you buried your head. You did like a couple thousand videos without getting traction. And he's mm -hmm. done well over, I think, 13,000 videos at this time. And so he, he was able to retire at 45 years old. And he doesn't need to work. He does it because he's passionate about helping other people. He's, he's got an economics background. And so I tune in every, every morning to, go, to figure out what's going on because he breaks it down for people that are dummies like me to understand what's what CPI and all these these acronyms. And so I, I wanted nobody else to, to start this event other than Michael, because I figured he can give an overview, even though his his forte is real estate investing, it, real estate business, it's all economics driven. And so without further ado, welcome. Thank you so much for, for coming on and presenting. Bo, I appreciate you for being a part of the channel. Uh, you bring a very unique and great opportunity. You are the concierge to small business loans. Uh, the fact that you come on every week uh, and help the audience is amazing. So it's the, it's the least I could do to give back. So uh, for the audience watching, I want to talk about three things. Uh, one, we're going to do an economics 101. Number two, we're going to talk about the 2024 economy. And yes, folks, in case you're not paying attention, we are already two months in to 2024. So we've got 10 months left. And then I'm going to talk about some big trends. So those are going to be the three topics we're going to go through. Uh, hopefully be able to do this in about a half hour or so, and then we'll take questions if you happen to have any. But so let's do economics 101, right? So I do have an econ degree. Uh, I do have a, uh, an MBA followed on that. I, have, I was an accountant. So numbers and finance are where I am comfortable. Uh, when you are an economist, you need to make a choice because the economy is a very complex and sophisticated, you know, it's just a lot of moving parts. And where I chose to focus my career or, or my area of interest is the consumer. And the consumer is important because it drives the economy. It is somewhere between 68 and 71% of GDP. It varies based on government spending and business investment, all of that. But Without a doubt, the consumer is the most important part of the economy, and I've been studying them for, for better than 30 years, so three decades. The first thing I want to talk about that I think a lot of kind of non-economists get in trouble with is, should I be looking at macro or micro economics? The very first class you typically take in the econ degree is macroeconomics. The second one you typically take is microeconomics. But what happens in daily life? In daily life, most of us are focused at the macro. The macro is the very big, you know, the big pieces. How are, is, you know, trade? How is relationships with foreign countries? How, how are these big pieces working in this complicated area? Most of us spend too much time and waste it and get all riled up with macro things, what's going on with the election, what's going on with this or that. If you are thinking about running a small business, if you are thinking about being a solopreneur, the macro means very little to you. 
you are operating, it should be operating at the micro level, right? Microeconomics. What is happening in your industry, in your city, in your customer base? I think the first thing I would do is if I was thinking about business operations is I would do the best I can to get out of the macro and into the micro. Again, the macro is where the news media wants you. The news media says if it bleeds, it leads. If it's scary, I'm going to report on it. They are trying to get you all excited about big, scary, gnarly things that frankly, on a day-to-day -day basis, mean very, very little to you individually at your family or in your business. Where most people don't spend time is in the micro. How can I control my household? What's going on with my household? What's going on with my business, my uh, you know potential business? What is going on with my customers? So the first piece of advice for most folks in this space is spend 90% of the time in the micro and 10% in the macro. I think most people reverse that. And that is why we don't see enough traction or forward momentum. The next thing you're going to do, if you're going to talk about economics 101, that you must do is something called supply and demand. Supply is often very easy to understand. How much of something is available? Oh, by the way, I could increase the production and there would be more supply. So we don't have to talk about supply very much. But we what we must talk about is demand. Because most people don't understand that demand is actually a two-step process. I think the best example of this is think of, of an exotic car, perhaps a Ferrari. There are lots of people that want the Ferrari. But, all, but demand is very little. Now, how can that be? Because want is only step one of the two-step function. You have to have the ability to pay. It's want or desire plus the ability to pay. That is really what demand is. And why is this important? This is if you're running a business or thinking about a franchise or a solopreneur is you have to understand that it's the desire, but also the ability. I think a lot of people do not understand that demand is a two-step function. The next thing to understand with Economics 101 leans accounting, but I think it is very important, especially if you're going to be running a small business. There are three financial statements. Two of them are talked about. One is ignored. And unfortunately, the one in, that is ignored is oxygen to your business. So as a small business owner, you cannot ignore it. What are these three statements? First, there is the balance sheet. Said in simple terms, if you know what your net worth is, the net worth is essentially your balance sheet. What are your assets minus your liabilities equals your owner's equity or your equity position? What are you worth? What's the business worth? What's the inventory? What's payables? What's the receivables? What is you know goodwill? What are all these accounting terms? What is the balance sheet? Balance sheet, in my opinion, is it's only valuable once a year when you go to your banker, when you have to show you know what your net worth is, what your what your financial well-being is. It's interesting to track monthly just to know that you're doing good work. But it's really, frankly, a number that has a lot of made up things, right? What's your car worth? What's this worth? What? It's all opinions. I'm not a big fan of my balance sheet. That said, for a decade, I, tra I tracked my balance sheet or net worth every month. So I'm a little bit of a hypocrite. I did track it once a month for 10 years. Since financial freedom, I haven't looked at it except when I have to give my financial statement to my bankers. Number two, your income statement. For most of you, this is your checking or savings account. How much money comes in, how much money goes out. How much income, how much expenses. And oh, by the way, at the bottom of that number is a discretionary income. I believe your income statement is far, far more important than the balance sheet. 
In fact, I think your income statement is the thing that you should focus on in the beginning because a lot of us don't have the financial reserves. We are not stacking paper to buy assets. So a lot of us need to focus on what I call discretionary income. How much money could you light on fire and nothing changes for you? That is discretionary income. You have heard Grant Cardone and Dadley talk about growing discretionary income. He lives on 20% and buys assets with the rest. That's the goal. The whole goal of earning financial freedom in a decade is you have to have the initial seeds to become investments. And that is without question discretionary income. Now, as a business owner, the most important statement that almost no one talks about and you have to become intimate with is the cash flow statement. The cash flow statement doesn't worry about revenue, doesn't worry about expenses, doesn't worry about how you're capitalizing or depreciating or any of this other accounting magic. It's how much cash comes in and how much cash goes out. Because if you don't know those numbers, you could technically be a wildly profitable company and bankrupt. If you are sending cash out faster than cash comes in, you can go bankrupt. Focus on the cash. If you are a small business or a solopreneur, you have to focus on the cash flow statement. Most, most people fail or businesses fail because cash runs out. It's the cash. It's not, hey, look, I'm a profitable business. I'm selling a thousand widgets and my margin is 39% and blah, 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 blah. No, I have no cash in the bank. I'm bankrupt. So the thing I would do as a small business owner, if I don't have any accounting background, is I would look up the cash flow statement long before I looked up the balance sheet and even before I looked up the income statement. If I was not comfortable with accounting, I would understand the cash flow statement first, the income statement second, and the balance sheet third. And then finally, the last thing in our first section of Economics 101 we'll talk about is consumer behavior. The consumer is important to watch because they have options. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just say, for example, like I think it was six months ago, beef became very expensive due to some supply chain issues. Well, consumers have this thing called switching costs. And if beef becomes too expensive, they will switch to chicken. For example, I think it was two quarters ago, Costco in their earnings announcements, flagged that the U.S. consumer is switching from beef to chicken. That tells you something. Beef is, quote unquote, the premium protein. Chicken is trading down. There is a switching cost. It's pretty easy to buy chicken versus beef if beef becomes too expensive. The other thing with the consumer you must be watching is, is the consumer afraid? The best example of this I have in the recent history was Silicon Valley Bank. If you happen to live in the Silicon Valley like I do, the day that Silicon Valley had a bank run, and let's be clear, they did have a bank run. They saw more than 50% of their deposits leave in an afternoon. It was frightening. What happened? Well, people got scared. They conserved. They didn't spend. They didn't have discretionary uh, you know, versus other expenses. They were really conserving. So when the consumer gets fearful, you will see their behavior change. And then the last thing about the consumer, at least in the US, is they don't stay afraid for very long. They can be, you know, typically speaking over historical terms, they're, they're afraid for a quarter or two. Or if you go back to the Great Recession, a year. We, we do not stay in that state long, but we can do it for a one to four quarters. So that's kind of my economic 101 primer. We'll switch gears to 2024 economy. The first thing that we need to kind of understand is the Fed, right? Don't fight the Fed. We clearly have the Fed in the most aggressive rate increase uh, in history. We've gone from basically zero to five and a quarter in record time. Uh, we have a Fed that is certainly preaching higher for longer. 
Uh, we have the market, the smart money, constantly wrong. If, they, if you watch the CME Fed tracker, uh, it seems like a month ago, the odds of a March rate cut were like 80%. Today, they're under 10. Right now, I believe the Fed mark, uh, CME tool is saying the Fed is going to cut in June to the tune of 70%. I don't know, right? We've got inflation being stickier. We get a jobs number on Friday that we'll have to watch uh, to see if it's crumbling or not. But the Fed is definitely in charge. We've got to figure out when they are um, going to reduce, or there's a chance that the Fed will be on hold all year. There's a chance that there are no rate cuts all year. The other thing that we've just started here is the Fed may have to raise rates. Q4 GDP came in at 3.2%, slightly down from 3.3. GDP tracker called GDP Now is currently estimating Q1 GDP at 2.3. Inflation is proven to be stickier. So maybe, maybe the Fed has to go up one more time. So the Fed is somebody we definitely have to watch. Typically speaking, they meet about every six weeks. The Fed, uh, the Fed presidents, of which there are 18 of them, typically talk. There's actually, I think, seven Fed speeches next week, uh, starting on Monday uh, and going through Friday. So again, we've got to pay attention. Two, interest rates. It might shock a lot of you to know that the Fed doesn't directly impact interest rates. They are where interest rates are built from, so they influence them. But the Fed is not directly setting mortgage rates. The Fed is not directly setting small business uh, loan rates, not setting um, HELOCs or any of that. They're just one piece of the machine. One of the important things that became obvious in the last year around interest rates is what's called the margin or the spread. What is that? So you could think of the Fed funds rate at you know, 5%, but now we have mortgage rates at 7 That's a spread. Historically speaking, mortgage rates, this is the 30-year owner-oc best credit mortgage rates, has been about 180 basis points or 1.8% higher than the 10-year bond. Last year, we saw that spread widen to record levels, to over 300 or 3%. That is a record. As of today, as of this recording, that spread has come down to about 275 or 2.75 basis points. It will be interesting to watch this spread. The reason we have to watch this is it tells us what banks think is coming. If, if the spread widens and goes back to 300 basis points, it could be a sign that the banks or lenders think the Fed is going higher because they want to control their risk on loans being refied if rates fall. Also, if the Fed stays on hold all year, will banks collapse the spread from 275 basis points to maybe 200 basis points? Why would they do that? Well, if banks have confidence that the Fed is on hold or going lower, they will have to compete for business. Eventually, what they will be doing is collapsing the spread. So we will be needing to watch interest rates. Next up in the 2024 economy that we should not forget is we will have an election, a presidential election. It will undoubtedly be one of the most expensive elections ever. And I'm willing to say it will be one of the most toxic elections ever. It seems to be an election that nobody wants, um, right? With two candidates that nobody likes or whatever. It's just, it's a repeat of four years ago. That election is going to take up a lot of headspace. But remember what I said earlier about macro and micro. It will undoubtedly be headline after headline, hate after hate. But that is all macro stuff. 
You have to operate in the micro. For most of us, especially if you are in small business, the more important elections are at the city or county or state level, not the presidential level. Remember, if you're going to be in this business, you have to understand what impacts you directly. And for most of you, it's county or state level versus presidential. The presidential election is undoubtedly important. It will set the tone for the next four years. But what is going to happen in your county, your city, or your state? So again, this is the whole notion of understanding and appreciating macro can be a distraction. Things operate at the micro. And then the final topic for the 2024 economy is recession, rolling recession, soft landing, hard landing. What are all of these names that you will undoubtedly hear repeatedly? So we'll go backwards just because I like to have fun. We'll start with hard landing. What is a hard landing? A hard landing is where uh, unemployment rate skyrockets quickly. I think the last reading was 3.7. A hard landing would probably see unemployment spike to over 5% within a 90-day window. It would be fast and it would be sudden. You would also see GDP contract meaningfully. We're talking about negative two, negative two and a half percent. It would be violent and it would be quick. That is a hard landing. A hard landing without question would, in, would have the Fed cut rates and cut rates quickly. So if you're in the camp of a hard landing is coming and it will be nasty, just know that the next domino will be the Fed cutting rates. Soft landing. A soft landing is something as an economist and somebody who studied it was always theoretical. It was always something that was like, hey, we could tinker at the edges and bring the economy in for a soft landing. So what might that look like? A soft landing might look like unemployment going up, but not meaningfully. Maybe it goes from 3.7 to 4.2, for example. So up, but not crazy. It would see GDP grow, but below trend. It would be maybe sub 1%. A soft landing might see the Fed tinker with rate cuts, maybe one or two. But in reality, if GDP is still positive, if we have sticky inflation and unemployment doesn't spike, it is very likely that the Fed does nothing. No rate hikes, no rate cuts all year. Now, what is a rolling recession? A rolling recession is pretty interesting. The, uh, the example that we have is 1991. A rolling recession is where things like mortgage in real estate, which are the most interest rate sensitive part of our economy, get hit hard and get hit hard fast. I don't think it's unreasonable to say that mortgage in the real estate industry is actually in a depression. We have seen real estate transactions go from 6.6 .6 to sub 4 million. I would call that a depression, not a recession. It is possible that we are starting to see green shoots in the housing industry, right? We've gone from a low of 3.79 million annualized transactions to about 4 million. There is talk or expectations that we could see annualized transactions possibly go as high as 4.2 or 4.3. Now, these numbers aren't earth shattering, but they are 10% better than last year, right? So that is a green shirt shoot. That is a net positive thing. And if we see real estate and mortgage come out, maybe manufacturing goes in, maybe technology, whatever. But the whole idea of a rolling recession is parts of our economy contract while others grow. And it is very counter cyclical. One looking at our economy today could probably squint and see a rolling recession. It is far too early to call it, but you can certainly say, you know what? This is not a normal recession. It does seem that parts of the economy got hit hard and hit first, 
and other parts of the economy are getting hit and hit hard now. And then finally, recession. This is this is something I want people to hear. Recessions are not to be afraid of. They are naturally parts of the business cycle. You can't, even though the Fed wants to make recessions a thing of the past, that is a bad thing long term. Recessions are a clearing function. They allow us to get rid of bad debt. They get allow us to get rid of bad investments. Um, they allow us to kind of see the best of the best get strong and the fake companies go bust. That's a good thing. The other thing to understand about our business cycle is historically speaking, recessions last between nine and 18 months while expansion lasts eight to 12 years. The last thing I will say about recessions is I hope you live through five or six of them. If you live through five or six recessions, it means you've lived a long time. And that's a good thing. You should enjoy life and recessions are a part of the process. The other thing I will say about recessions is they are uh, where wealth is built. This is where you can really get good deals and really get creative. So the last thing I'll talk about is big trends. Big trends. We are going to see the largest transfer of wealth. And this is especially important for small businesses. Baby boomers are going to transfer an estimated of 90, 90 trillion dollars from themselves to perhaps millennials. Fun fact. Most millennial kids want nothing to do with mom and dad's business. Most of these businesses can still thrive. And it is your job, working with the concierge of small business lending, Bo Eckstein, to figure out how you can get creative and put deals together that allow the baby boomer to cash out, to transfer this living, breathing entity so that you can go forward. Again, this will be the largest transfer of wealth in human history when baby boomers transition out. And oh, by the way, the average baby boomer is 67 years old today. How many of them want to get out of their business in the next three to five years? I'm going to guess a lot of them. So you are in the right place doing the right things today. Number two, understand that terms are far better than price. A lot of us, especially in real estate, get fixated on list price. A lot of you in business might get excited by the price of the business. I challenge you, I implore you to work with Bo Eckstein, the concierge of small business loans, to understand how you could use terms, how you can have the seller take back a second, how they can be a part of this so that you could get in for very little money down, how you can get a blended interest rate, how you could push off payments to the future. Get creative. And then the last thing kind of setting up the next speaker is the tax code. A lot of people think the tax code is a penalty-based system. It actually isn't. I know we all want to say bad things about the IRS and this, that, the other thing. The tax code, whether we like it or not, is written to encourage certain behavior and to discourage other behavior. As the tax code is written today, and I challenge you to ask the next speaker, it is challenging you to understand that owning and running small businesses, right? Because small businesses employ people. Small businesses make the economy grow. So the tax code, whether we like it or not, is written to encourage small business ownership and discourage being employees. It's just how it's written. No judgment. It's just a fact. So, Bo, that's what I brought. Economics 101, 2024 uh, economy and big trends. Happy to take some questions. Sure. Somebody uh, put in the chat. I think you used the abbreviation CME and they were wondering what that stands for. CME is a Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It's basically an entity that collects the and has bets on when the Fed um is going to cut rates and the current odds or bets is 70% uh, 
uh, that they will be cutting in June. So it's a uh, commercial mercantile exchange. It's just, you know, Chicago mercantile exchange. So it's just an entity that, that collects the bets, if you will. So uh, for, for some, some of the, the people that are watching this right now um, that may not know you, a lot of people do that are on, I'm sure, but um, can you just talk to people about your journey just to kind of give them a background on, on what you did to get financial freedom? And then we can maybe correlate it with, you know, if somebody's maybe 45 or 50 years old right now and doesn't have 16, 17 years, why kind of maybe accelerating that with business ownership, but give them the process and how you did it. I think that's would be relevant. Yeah. So kind of a nutshell. Um, I was always an employee. I'm not an entrepreneur. Uh, I was raised to go to school, get a good job, make a lot of money and retire at 65. I thought that was the way to do it. Uh, I unfortunately was investing during the dot-com era. I turned seven grand into almost 200, only to lose 80% of it very quickly. Uh, so at 30 years old, I was coming off a massive loss, a massive defeat. I was depressed. I went into a Borders bookstore on Stevens Creek. I'm in the Silicon Valley. And I found Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad unlocked a part of my mindset that I didn't know was there that you could own real estate. Nobody in my life had ever done that. Uh, I went on a year journey to kind of understand what that was, rental properties. I spent a year investigating the Bay Area, which never made sense. Ultimately found Fresno, California. And my goal in the beginning, Bo, was just to get four rentals. I wanted to get four rentals because I knew if I worked to 65 and I had four free and clear properties, my, you know, my old life, you know, when I was 65 would be better than most. That was the grand plan. Little did I know that once you get in the game of real estate and you really learn it, you can really start playing Monopoly for real. I bought eight green houses to use a Monopoly term. And then in 2006, I sold my eight houses and moved the equity into red hotels. Uh, I've got 80 units in different multifamily buildings. And then obviously I went through the real estate crash uh, I started raising millions and millions of dollars in private money and ultimately got to a portfolio of 187 units at the peak and retired at 45. Um, you know, I was, I was always employed, not an entrepreneur. I just, I just never got that. So I had to make a lot of money. We had to live below our means. We, we started living on 50% of our income so that we could stack discretionary income. Like I talked about earlier and kept buying assets. I think getting wealthy is simple, create discretionary income, become elite at something, and then do it for 10 years. Kind of going to part two of your question. I think a lot of folks are small business minded, are able to do that, are able to leverage the tax code. And I think running a business, if that's your thing, if that's what you want to become a elite at, is a great way to do it. And um I think it does offer folks options, whether it's a franchise or buying something from a baby boomer. I think the whole idea is become elite at something. That's that's the key, right? Whatever your thing is, mine happened to be real estate in Fresno, California. Your thing could be laundry mats. Your thing could be, uh, you know, Aussie bowls. Whatever whatever your thing is, get focused and go after it. That that's that's really good advice. So I think. So for some of you that are watching, some of the takeaways are that you will need to u utilize delayed gratification. If you most likely, it, it may not come easy to you. I know we look on social media and everybody, it comes easy to everybody. But um, Michael's story really was delayed gratification. I mean, he was successful in his career. He's really good at what he did, but he was focused, right? And that's oh, yeah. why he got the name The Hammer. So whatever you want to do, and so my background's mostly been in the lending industry. I've owned real estate brokerages, flipped houses, owned some rental properties. Uh, and then over the last six years, really got into business financing and then owned some business now. And I really think like right now you could be in a, in a transition where you're in your, like for, for me, for example, I'm 46 years old, right? Like I didn't build a, a cash flow portfolio. I, I mean, I own several rentals, but nothing like Mr. Zubris, right, where I can retire. So I'm thinking right now, look, I've got to make some serious moves because I want to be able to do what Zubra did, right? Like at some point, I might be 10 years later, 
but that's because I didn't really utilize the delayed gratification he did. He he was able to to really focus and live below his means. And he he told a good story. We we just had a his he has a YouTube channel, obviously, and he had his fifty thousand subscriber party here in Las Vegas. Uh, and he tells a story about how he came from a party of of somebody that worked underneath him when he was an employee, yeah. and they had like the big mansion house with a nice you know hundred thousand dollar ride outside. And when he was driving home with his wife, he started to cry. Right? He he was he was he was crying because he had he's worked so hard. I'm getting chills right now because he worked so hard and he was like, I, I am not doing anything. You know, he, he, he was buying houses. So when he got back to his house, this is a powerful story. It really is. When he got back to his house, his wife who did the books and, and was really kind of the numbers person said, Mike, look, look. And he finally kind of lifted up, right. And looked and realized that he's accomplished so much. So now I always think, I think I listen to David Goggins a lot and, you know, he wrote the book, Can't Hurt Me. And I think, you know, although not from a physical standpoint, but you remind me a lot of Goggins and Goggins, like the mindset part of it, right? Is that mm -hmm. I think, I think about that. So everybody that's here today and maybe that watches this in the future, I think, you know, some of us might get lucky in life, but the majority of us won't. But but luck will turn if we do the work. And that's what it really equates to. Michael and Bo, I, I have a question that, that sure. I think a lot of people might be thinking in their heads. Um, Michael, you said that, you know, you need to become elite at something and do it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't start out being an elite real estate investor. You started out. It's kind of like in the corporate world, they often talk about we're building the plane as we're flying it. It's mm -hmm. kind of what you did. So how do you do that? How did you learn to do? And I think you can apply this to business. It's, it's really no difference. It, it bugs me when when real estate people don't don't call what they do a business <laughs> because it is a business. Um, so how do you apply, you know, how do you apply that to business in general? But how do you become elite um, when you don't know anything? And, and yes. how, how how do you not like have that? analysis paralysis that a lot of people have. One of the things you have to do is you have to get focused. Okay, great. What the hell does that mean? Let me give you my example. So I already shared earlier that I live in the Silicon Valley. I wasted a year trying to find cash flow here. I then go to Fresno, California. This is important. I never lived there. I didn't know one. Didn't know anyone. Had no, I'd only driven through it once when I was a teenager going to Yosemite. So completely new market to me. I now need to learn Fresno like I know the Bay Area. I had lived in the Bay Area at this point 31 years. I know the Bay Area. I don't know Fresno. So how do you learn it? Well, you have to create something that I ultimately call a buy box. Well, what the heck does that mean? Fresno, California is about a million people. What I had to do after talking to 5, 10, 20 people is I had to get focused. So I chose a zip code called 93703. It's called the Mayfair District. Why did I choose that? Well, after talking to 20 people, most people said the Mayfair District is the place to be. I'm like, great. I don't live there. Let's look at the Mayfair. Then going to the Mayfair District, that is too big, right? It's full of houses and condos and duplexes and apartments and mobile homes. I'm like, too much. So I chose single family homes. Then single family homes, there's still too much. There's little ones. There's big ones. There's two stories. There's McMansions. That's all this. So I chose three or four bedrooms, two car garage, one story uh, between um, 1,200 and 2,000 square feet. Why? Because that defined criteria produced like 35 active listings. I believe your buy box has to get so focused as to produce 20 to 40 active listings. And then the magic happens. I only, only, this is the hammer in action, only looked at that buy box for three years. If it wasn't a three or four bedroom, two bath, two car garage between 1,200 and 2,000 square feet in the Mayfair district, it might as well not have existed. 
It is all I looked at. So now translate this to business. If you are going to run a laundromat or Aussie bowls or some home services thing, you have to get remarkably focused. Who's going to be your customers? Who is going to be this? Who's going to be that? There's a lot of reasons to be distracted. Go back to our very first point, macro versus micro. There's a lot of macro in our world, but macro is not where you become elite. You become elite by focusing on the micro and becoming remarkably focused. If you are focused, like if you do a franchise or a business and you are worried about the freaking presidential election, you are not paying attention. There are so many more micro things going on that directly impact your business. You've got to, you've got to go down. So the buy box in real estate, the buy box in business rewards the people who are focused on what matters. And it rewards people who ignore things that don't matter. Um, M Michael, why don't you talk, this is, I think is relevant too, and talk about, I like this conversation because I think how you just started your YouTube channel and, and, mm -hmm. and why somebody out there should document and maybe consider starting a, a YouTube channel. Yeah, one of the things I would highly recommend a small business owner do, again, focusing on the micro, is I would create a channel. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're a CPA, home services, painting, plumbing, osseo bowls, whatever it is. One of the ways that you could become known is being a home services business for your, I think you said earlier, somebody had a full franchise in Texas. You need to own that. You need to become the person for that thing in your area. Again, be micro. If you are running a home servicing business like power washing or AC repair or whatever, you need to produce content. Your daily job, what you're doing, your customer visits, whatever, for your location. You need to own the search results for your city. I know people who uh, invest out of state they have very, very, very small channels, but they are getting deal flow. They are raising money because they are known as the king of Gary, Indiana. They are the king of Northwest Indiana. You don't have to be Graham Stephan with 4.2 million followers. You could have 500 followers, produce three videos a week and get deal flow. Getting deal flow, think about it this way. You are getting paid to market what you do. YouTube is paying you, if you get monetized, to market what you do. If you are going to have a franchise or buy a small business and YouTube is not part of your strategy, you are missing the boat. It is such, it's such an easy thing to do. And again, if you're becoming elite at home services or vending machines or whatever, just tell your story. It doesn't have to be highly produced. You will become the owner of that space very quickly. I highly recommend it. What's your kind of your tagline when it comes to uh, creating content for YouTube? Do the work. Do the work. If you are running a small business, it's not a charity. Give value, give, 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 build deal flow, close customers. It, it'll, it will, it, it'll take time. It'll take six months. But as long as you're recording authentic stuff, you will be rewarded. And and what has it done just from, you know, having a channel and, and growing your channel? You've gotten on much, much bigger stages, right? You're now interacting. You you interviewed Graham Stephan, which is one of the biggest YouTube influencers. Talk about like how how this just will, it'll open up so many doors for you. Yeah, I think the biggest thing to talk about is community. One of the things, and we just had a celebration in Vegas with you know 300 and some people, 100 and some people watching. But what I saw at that event and was surprised was the impact of a community. When you put out good stuff and you're authentic, you attack, you attract your tribe, your people, and your people take on your your personality, go giver, helpful, not showboating, not big timing. It was amazing to watch the audience network. So I would tell you the more important thing is community. But yes, with consistency and focus, you will be invited to speak on big stages. I'll be speaking at WealthCon 
in April. Um, I've been lucky enough to interview both Graham Stephan and meet Kevin and Ryan Pineda and Tom Ferry, and the list goes on and on, and Elena Cardone. All of these folks have been on my channel. So again, you could get in rooms with very big people, be asked to speak on big stage, but the most important thing is you will have impact. And I want to go back to video number one on my channel. I'm sitting on my couch. I'm wearing a purple polo. And the reason I went down this rabbit hole is I wanted to create a legacy. What did that mean to me? I wanted to create something that outlived me by 50 years. At some point in the future, I will die. My physical body will stop functioning. I want somebody 50 years after that to still talk about Michael Zuber. That is my North Star. That is why I wake up every day. And that's why I just keep giving because that's my North Star. If you want to grow fast on YouTube and you want to make money with AdSense, here's the secret. Be a doomer. Put poison in the world. That is not something I will ever do because I'm chasing impact, not a couple of pennies. Love it. Well, thank you so much. Guys, go to uh, YouTube, put in one rent all at a time, subscribe to the channel listen to it. I usually, when I'm getting ready for work, shaving my head, <laughs> I'm watching it, listening, and I'm getting some I don't need. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then go get the book. Because I think today's, today's event is really about, it's not just about buying a business. It's not just buying real estate. It's collectively growing your wealth and growing your, your impact. And so that's what I really wanted to, to put together today. And, um, and I just think, look, Read, read about the buy box in one run at a time. And I encourage you, I will always be a real estate investor. I'll always be a business, an entrepreneur. I think you pull these together because like if you don't have a portfolio right now, if you want to maybe try to supercharge a little bit, read the book. That's the strategy for the long-term wealth is buying one run at a time. And just don't, don't worry about the 180 that Zuber got to, right? Worry about the four he talks about. Get those four and then progress from there and let it be. And, 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 and you know, utilize the wealth of information on, on his channel, my channel, learn about what financing, how to get in. Maybe you're thinking, well, I don't have much money. There's ways we talk about creative financing. You're gonna listen to a lot of real estate investors and entrepreneurs that are buying businesses with very little, little out of cash, out of pocket. So there, there's opportunity for of all of us. And even if you wanna keep the job, maybe just from a taxation standpoint, this is the information that we want to share with you to, to you so you can learn as we're learning, right? Because we keep on learning. And, and that's what I really kind of fired me up. Like the, talking economics to me isn't that very, very exciting, but the just knowing that in the back of your mind, what it can do for you and then kind of building your buy box from there and understanding, look, the world's not coming to an end. Mm -hmm. Forget about who's the president and focus on doing the work. And that's what really, in my mind, Zuber does for me and motivates me to do. So I hope you guys got a little of that flavor today. Um, we're just waiting for Michael Reeder to join us, our CPA. He should be here any minute. Uh, I know you You said you had a podcast to do. So yep. Yeah, I got to go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Really Thank you. It. it was awesome.